All right. Third meeting we have recorded here now for the, I guess I don't have to keep calling it the web client SDKs anymore, for Wharf, for Wharf Kit. Um, today, we figured we'd kind of a short update and then dive into more technicals as on the progress we're making uh, with specifically the session kit. Uh, we do have some other progress on the other kits, but this one is kind of the bedrock for a lot of the others. Um, both the account kit and the contract kit are, they're, they're new things. They're things that we haven't seen before, so there's not really anything comparable to, but both of them will be leveraging the session kit and the session kit the equivalent in the um, kind of the current ecosystem we have right now is both parts of EOSJS and parts of UAL. So those both are being combined into one thing and currently being called the session kit. Uh, we figured this is going to, the idea behind the session kit is, is that we're taking something that web developers are pretty familiar with, which is sessions. It's like this thing that's authenticated with this other thing to be able to perform read and write operations. Um, obviously, with the blockchain, you don't need a session to read data, but you kind of do to write data. So Anchor Link itself, our SDKs that we've used that were embedded into uh, both UAL and Transit, when Transit was a thing, um, we used the idea of sessions, and now we're kind of surfacing that up to create this kind of first class object that web developers are going to be used to. Um, I guess before diving too deep into the session kit itself, um, we are continuing on the branding that we covered in the last meeting. Uh, the website has gone live. It was live during the last meeting. It's been updated a little bit. All of these calls are going to be posted there. Um, we're currently working on a site map for the bigger website that's going on. Um, the branding is being assembled into kind of a more formal uh, packaging. So that way maybe we can deliver that as a milestone uh, in the coming weeks and have something that is distributable for people that want to use this branding somewhere. I don't know if that's how applicable that'll be to many projects, but to have that you know the concrete document available so that way, as this project moves forward, if none of us are here, there's this branding kit that kind of defines what it is and whoever, whether it's one of us or all of us are still working on this kind of project, will be able to take that document and continue to run with the brand that's being created. It's kind of, it's that permanent piece, that legacy of what's being created to ensure continuity. Um, aside from branding, we dove into a little bit internally the uh, account kit and contract kits these week, this week. Um, just to give kind of a brief primer on those, the account kit is going to be the place where you can take an account and retrieve and generate transactions based on kind of that account. It's really for account management. That sort of thing is going to be really useful in web wallets, block explorers, uh, I guess wallets in general. It's going to be this component that if you are doing any form of um, users managing their own account, that the account kit's kind of going to be the place to simplify a lot of that. The account kit, I don't think um, it may or may not be reliant on the contract kit in some forms. That's one of the reasons the account kit's not fully fleshed out like the session kit kind of is. Um, because the account kit itself is going to leverage the system contracts. And the contract kit, which I'll just move into, I guess, um, it's both kind of a code generator, and it is a way to encapsulate smart contract actions, data, that kind of stuff into JavaScript code to make it that much easier to use some form of contracts within your application. Um, I'm hoping in the coming weeks we'll be able to have some good examples of how that works. I think our first target that we're working on is the core system contracts. Those will be kind of our benchmark on how the contract kit actually works. 
but the contract kit itself will be usable for any contract by any developer. We're obviously not going to do them all ourselves, but it has to be a kit that people are going to be able to use to make um, their own applications with their own contracts and just be this tool to really simplify using it. Right now, it's a pretty manual process for those of you that have used EOSJS and have experienced building custom interfaces for your contracts in the past. Um, but underlying to all of those is this session kit, and that's kind of where we're diving in today. Um, the session kit, I think, from our perspective, was one of the more straightforward and dependency-free parts of this framework. Um, it, like I kind of said at the beginning, it is part uh, of what EOSJS used to do for us, mainly the transact method, which if you saw the message in the WorfKit channel, um, that's I posted a couple of links, which we'll probably get into on this call. Um, so it'll encapsulate the transact call that we're all kind of familiar with. It'll be different, but it serves the same purpose. And the session kit also takes over all the responsibilities that you would have expected UAL to. Those will be kind of an add-on to the session kit. Uh, we haven't quite figured out the st repository structure for that yet, because the session kit also works uh, in browserless environments. When, you know, you're writing a, a Node.js script that is, um, I don't know, automatically powering up a specific account. The session kit can do that. You will establish a local session, which we'll get into, and be able to do those sorts of operations easily. So I guess as a preface that the code we're showing in the session kit and we're working on today is very low level. And it its goal really is to replace that transact call from EOSJS. I know this project overall, we wanted to simplify how people interact with smart contracts. The part we have done so far is not that simple part that replaces how people currently interact with it. It is the replication of that and the improvement of that. So that way, at some point, we can build the sim like the simpler layer on top of it. So, But the way that we're doing this code base um, is going to offer a lot of additional flexibility that we just have never had before. I've already started kind of geeking out about other thing. You can see there's like an empty repo for a resource provider plugin. Um, there's no code there yet, but I that's one of the use cases that I have started experimenting with. If you've tried to do that in EOSJS, you know that you kind of need to rip EOSJS apart in order to accomplish that goal to be able to co-sign a transaction and cover the resource costs for users. And this sort of plugin architecture that we'll be diving into really helps automate that a little bit or helps abstract that so that way not everybody has to reinvent that wheel. So, so yeah, I guess before I go any further, um, are there any thoughts, any questions, anything that's not session related we want to talk about beforehand? Um, yeah, I'll just kind of open it up. Um, I have a question to, is this where, and do you have on the radar or in the plans um, to support um, signing arbitrary strings, like a you know login message or whatever it might be, just to prove your account. I know that's part of ESR in a way through login, um, but more like arbitrary strings. And then to pile on with that um, asymmetric encryption, um, any any plans or thoughts about supporting that in a way? You could do a lot of interesting things, you know, with with like a asymmetric encryption and off-chain messaging and stuff like that. I think this would be the place to do it. Uh, I, It's not currently in our plans that in order to be able to do that right now, like we would have to devote some effort into Anchor being able to support those types of operations. Right now, like the ESR protocol, all it does is uh, offer signing of transaction objects. Like you can't pass an arbitrary string unless it's within a transaction to uh, something like the ES ESR protocol. Um, so yeah, I think right now we're focusing on transaction signing. But if we can, if there is a way that those arbitrary strings could be signed within the structure of a transaction, then 
yeah, that should be possible within this. Um, the session kit itself right, does. Are you saying that there would be no way to find an arbitrary message? What was that? Sorry, there was. Are we saying there's no way to sign arbitrary data as a message? Correct, unless it's within some kind of uh, transaction shaped object. Right, because the structure of ESR payloads is is a transaction, right? And even like, if I recall when I was doing the Java work, even the login is still effectively kind of like a transaction. Yeah. Yeah, the, and that's to uh, make sure that ledger support works. Like the ledger is not capable of signing, at least at this very moment in time, signing anything that's not a transaction. So the identity requests in the ESR protocol are kind of fake transactions. They're completely invalid if you were trying to submit them to the blockchain, but they still resemble a transaction. And that's why uh, ledger users can actually sign those. It's because the ledger just thinks it's a transaction and it returns a signature. So in order to get to the point where we have like full coverage of straight up arbitrary strings, we would need Anchor to be updated. We need the ledger to be updated. Um, and I don't know the status of other wallets. We just lost Nathan. <laughs> so yeah, I think well, I that kind of wanders outside of the scope of what we're doing right now. But it will be possible to do that stuff should the wallets themselves support that. Yeah, I'll, I'll consider the seed planet because I think both arbitrary strings and asymmetrical encryption introduce, there's a lot of really cool use cases that you can solve for with, with both of those. And you know what I mean by asymmetrical encryption, right? Or is it worth? Uh, are we talking like being able shared keys and like? It's like I, I can, I, I've done it with USJS, just boiler, like in Node, just to prove the concept, but I can I can take some data, and I can sign it with your public key, and send it yeah. to you, and you can decrypt it with your private key. But I never had your private key, all I, and so I don't need to need to know you or have any channel necessarily with you. I can just say, oh, you know, Aaron.gm has this private key on his active permission. I'm gonna go ahead and sign some stuff that I only want him to see, and I'm gonna broadcast it on chain or put it on pastebin or whatever the hell you want to do with it. And if you decide that you want to decrypt it, you can decrypt it and only you can decrypt it. Um, yep. Being able to make that a process that more than the people on this call can do is where, you know, a wallet would have to come into the picture, right? Yeah. Yeah, completely. Um, and since those aren't possible with some wallets, I don't think it's in the scope of development right now, but that's not to say that it couldn't be in the future. Yeah. Um, Probably yeah, similarly, I, uh, similarly like the light wallet concept too. Yeah. So this is, we actually had uh, this problem with Scatter where we were stuck between the chicken and egg situation where, where do we add it first? Do we add it to the library or do we add it to, um, to the wallet? And then what about wallet support for everybody else? Because there's a lot of other wallets using the, the library. Uh, and in the end, we just added, added it to both. So maybe there is a place for it just to be scaffolded out right now inside of the client SDK so that wallets know that it's coming and can take measures for the future, right? Yeah. We'd really need some kind of like protocol for that. Um, and I think another option to achieve this kind of thing is going to be through the plugin system. Um, part of yeah. where we're driving this is that we want uh, the request for permission system from the that we kind of outlined in the wallet paper, where you have a key in the browser itself that is published somewhere. Maybe it's um, maybe it's on your account, and the only thing that it could perform on your account is like a no op action. It like actually doesn't have any access to your account on chain and can't really do anything. Mm -hmm. But that key could just live inside of WarfKit as uh, a private key and be used to decrypt and encrypt information without actually needing to go to the wallet. So there are a few paths we could take to do that kind of stuff, um, even before uh, there's full wallet support. But to get to that like full wallet support, I think we do need some sort of 
protocol level change that all wallets could then implement um, in order to make sure that, you know, the data could make it back and forth. Like right now, I think there's kind of a limit. If we did it in Anchor, for example, I'd just talk on that end because that's what I know. Um, we have uh, payload size restrictions. So like the messages that are being sent back and forth to decrypt or encrypt would have to like fit within a certain constraint. And I believe the ledger is also the same way. Like in order to decrypt something with a ledger, the payload has to be small enough. So I don't know what that size is for either of them off the top of my head, but those would have to be defined, researched to make sure they fit within that those constraints that those protocols are using, and then standardized so that way we could make sure that all of the wallet providers could actually receive and return that type of data. So I, I get why people want it, though. <laughs> is, is there anything that you have planned kind of in the spirit of what Nathan said, um, of like a supports interface kind of thing, or, um, I mean, that's what they do like in ERC standards, you know, there's a supports interface and then you can ask, you can ask if the implementation supports a particular thing. Um, and then, you know, that way on the consumer side of, of this code, I could kind of programmatically just enumerate wallets and determine which one of them supports, supports one features. HPIs. Yeah, so like that way you could, in, in, in my head, you could have stubbed out, you know, like if, if you if you want to add a feature, you just kind of stub out a no op and default to false, right? And then if Anchor wants to support it, Anchor overrides the no op implementation and sets the supports flag to true for something. Uh, I guess you could always do that later too, but it's just like an interesting kind of concept I've seen that might make sense for that type of thing where not everybody's going to support it right away, but um, there's a programmatic way to determine who does. And it encourages them to right? see that, oh, look, we're not implementing these three things that maybe other people are, and all we have to do is implement them and we can participate in that functionality, uh, you know, motivate them to, to do it. So this is yeah. No, that's a good idea. Um, I think right now, we're doing, there's two methods in the session kit. One of them is a login method and the other one is a transact method. Um, and those are the common denominators that everything is gonna support. They're gonna support it in different ways based on the wallet, but those two functions will be the only things. But having some sort of like flags that say which of these features the wallet support is definitely a good idea. Um, as we stub out this additional functionality. I just jotted down a quick note to kind of explore how that might fit in. I don't know if that's within the scope of what we're doing right now, just because we're trying to just encapsulate and work on the stuff that works with every wallet as is today. Um, but it's definitely something we can explore. It's just, I think that answers it. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Let's move on. Cool. Uh, any other topics we want to jump into early? Otherwise, we can kind of get into those common functions that everything's going to support. Yeah, Aaron, I love a quick overview of the pack, the pack, the plugin. Sorry, not packages. Uh, just how they're constructed and what type of stuff would go in them versus what type of stuff would be. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to answer. So I think diving into how the transact stuff works right now might cover that. Um, we do, we've been kind of iterating on how the plugins actually work, but we do have some rough examples of them right now. Um, I, I think maybe we dive into the transact call and then that'll kind of answer the question. Cool. All right, anything else before I kind of dive into that? 
All right. Well, let's just kind of dive into the session side of things. Um, session kit itself, I put a link in that channel. It's also on the Wharf Kit org for uh, on GitHub. The sessions themselves, the thing we kind of want to dive into today is how these sessions actually perform transactions. And I think that's going to lead directly into um, how these plugins operate. So if you actually, like, a, I'll go through the code itself. I won't get too in depth on it. This is all still very much subject to change. The reason we're starting to talk about it so early is that we're doing the golf rounds, which we're going to probably start talking about in the coming weeks more publicly. Um, the the kind of the public announcements are going to lag behind these calls. These calls are going to kind of be the first introduction of some of these things, and then we will move into a very a much broader public audience to kind of seek feedback and stuff like that, um, widening the funnel as we move along. Um, but for sessions themselves, we have currently the transact structure itself worked out. Again, subject to change. Um, but just to dive straight into this, it'll be very familiar if you know the EOSJS transact call patterns uh, in terms of how it can work. It is reverse compatible with EOSJSs, so that way we this is at a production level and developers are ready to move over, they will be able to just drop in the replacement for this. They might have to change some of their parameters. Um, but I guess just to dive into it, the way we have this set up with the transact call is that each transaction is going to have its own context. The context itself is this instance, this temporary thing that contains the state of what's happening with the transaction as you're performing it. Um, we're passing in things like an API client. Here's the plugins that currently can either be passed in as the as kind of a global, which is where these transact plugins come from, or they can be passed in directly during a transact call. We're currently kind of debating on at which points it makes sense to pass these plugins in. Right now it's everywhere, but it may change based on feedback from you guys, based at feedback on the discussions we have. Um, but for the this conversation, the plugins themselves are part of this context that lives within each individual transaction being performed by the session kit. Um, there are some options that you can pass to plugins. These are free form. This is just a straight up object that you know, if you're using a third-party plugin, they may ask you to pass in specific parameters to do specific things. This will be where they can be passed in. Um, and then we also are passing in the whoever this account performing the transaction is. Um, the way the transact method actually works is we're using signing requests for everything. Signing requests, no matter what you pass into the transact call, it gets converted into an ESR payload. And we have a function above this if you want to look at it. it probably will look familiar to some EOSJS stuff, um, but it is it is taking all those various parameters that you could potentially pass in while performing a transaction and converting it to a signing request. That way, we gain the benefits of the metadata that can be associated with it. Uh, we can clone the request easily. There's just there's a whole bunch of benefits that we get by actually making them signing requests. Um, we start the response immediately. This is what the transact call is going to return. It's going to return uh, all the signatures, who actually signed it, the transaction, uh, the resolved signing request, which is if you haven't worked with signing requests, they have placeholders. You can perform a transaction and say, I want, I don't know the account. Like, I don't know what permission is going to be used. I don't. Like you can pass in a transaction with unknown information, and that information as placeholders will be templated in based on the user, for example, that's performing the transaction. So just to give you a sense of what this result that is actually going to be returned from the transact call looks like, um, that's kind of what it's going to be. There are flags that are going to be able to be passed in the options either globally or per transaction call. One of them is allow modify, which we'll get into in a little bit as we get into this first plugin, which is right below. And then also a broadcast flag, which I think most people are familiar with. Um, but this is effectively how the 
the plugins for the session kit are going to function. Um, the session kit is going to have two different kinds of plugins as it stands today. One of them is a login plugin, and there are two events that they can hook into. And the other one is a transact plugin, and there are four hooks that you can hook into during that process. These plugins are, they can either be kind of anonymous functions, or they can be full-blown like classes that you could build these plugins based on. Um, and during, like we're just in the transact call right here. During this transact call, we're going to iterate over all of the hooks that are meant to be executed before we even sign the transaction, before we relay this transaction to a wallet. This, a good example of this is co-signing. If we want to co-sign a transaction for any purpose and have it have something like fuel on it, before the user actually signs it, we want to process that transaction and append the no-op action. Or maybe we want to use the upcoming feature of that, I think it's context-free data that can be on the transaction to indicate who pays for the transaction. We don't want the developer to have to specify that every time. So instead of doing that, they can include a plugin that will execute before signing that modifies the transaction. And this is where that allow modify flag comes in. By default, allow modify will be true. And that allow modify flag allows the before sign hooks to actually change the transaction that the developer passed in for whatever purpose. Um, Cosigning is just kind of one of the easiest ones to represent. And then if allow modify is true, we're able to clone the request that was passed in and make it the current request for any future hook that is going to be executed. I'm going to stop here for a second because I may have overlooked something that like, I know very well that maybe doesn't make sense to you guys. So if there is anything that kind of hasn't made sense so far, well, let me know. Can I, do you have an example of how the user would implement this? Because this is internal for their library, correct? Uh, yes. Right now. Yes. Uh, GitHub. The, um, most of these are stubbed out pretty well in the tests right now. Uh, if we look at, I'm wondering if the resource provider test kind of shows this. This is kind of a more complicated hook. Uh, well, actually, let's start here. Um, now, this is probably the wrong test. Looking for one that has a plugin. So there are plugins. That makes more sense. For signing hooks, where are we getting those? For mock hooks. Uh, up one folder. There's the pre sign hook. So, oh, context. Okay. Yeah. so, this is using the class variation of this. And these can also just be anonymous functions, like I was saying. Um, currently, this is a plugin that you would pass in to, like, when you are instantiating the session kit or you are instantiating the session or potentially when you are actually performing a transaction. You would pass one of these plugins in to the session kit somewhere. I'll just leave it at that. And what these plugins do is, is they register hooks into the transaction flow or into the login flow based on what kind of plugin they are. Um, in this instance, you can see it's taking this context, which is the transaction context that we were looking at in the session itself, it has all the information about the transaction that wants to be performed. And it is adding a hook that is the type of before sign. And it is passing in, in this case, a function. Um, this function, this mock transact resource provider pre-sign hook, which is super long, but uh, is up here. And it is a function, it's asynchronous, that takes the request in as well as the context. And then it runs through a series of operations and then ultimately returns either 
the same request, a modified request, or signatures. There may be more information. We need to kind of explore a lot more use cases to figure out the potential output of this. Um, but for this specific plugin, what it's doing is it is just appending this no op action. Um, so that way it can be, you know, that first action will assume the resource billing. So, so this is exactly what I was asking. Um, is there going to be some kind of way to have this pre scaffolded so that users can make it very easy instead of having to rewrite this specific code, for instance? These will be distributed as additional packages that you can then just include. Um, like, I imagine that this, like, let's say we get around to writing one of these for fuel. It will look like this. We will distribute the code base. And then for the developer that actually wants to use it, it will I'll be just pull in the mock transact function. Yeah. Um, or get session. I think one of the other unit tests might show better how these are actually being passed in. Um, plugins? Nope, that's empty. Transacts. This is an example of passing it in during an actual transaction call. Um, I think there should be in session. There we go. So this would be like the instantiation of the actual session kit itself. And you can see that we're passing the plugin just as a parameter. So when they're constructing it, they would include this from the third party library and just pass it in as a parameter. And then any session that the session kit creates or any transaction that's executed by any session will inherit this plugin. And this will just execute on all of those. So they could just. Like you call transact, as long as it originated from this form of the session kit, that plugin will exist. And that plugin could be from an NPM library. Now, is this the top level of WARF? Is this what a, a user, a developer would import as their entry point? This is the top level of the session kit. But when we were originally describing this project, it was that there's going to be all these individual kits, and then there's going to be kind of an abstraction layer on top of it, kind of a quote unquote starter kit. Right. Right. Um, and in the starter kit, it's going to do this for With, them. OK, so there, there'd be flavors of it, like a WAC starter kit and the EOS starter kit, yep. whatever it might be. Yep. Got it. Or potentially, like, a, here's a recommended kit, and the recommended kit we we're going to include a resource provider. We're going to include maybe an IBC functionality. We're going to include um, the starter kit is uh, a col the collection of all of the kits that are part of Wharf, as well as like recommended plugins. Right. Well, also the chains. Like um, this has always been a problem that we've had, where we had to specify uh, a lot of different information to really set up just the initial SDK. Yeah, and it'd be nice if we had just the ability to say, "Hey, new EOS or new Wax or new whatever," and then we could specify some optionals in there as well. Yep, and that'll that'll be possible at that like high level starter kit where we're you're like you said, here's an EOS starter kit. It defines the chain. It defines some API endpoints. It defines some plugins that are really useful. And then they would just literally say, uh, you know, log in wherever it fits in their code or transact, and it will just get all that information. And when the developer wants to dive deeper, they can then maybe start using the session kit directly, or they can start manually creating sessions. Like the rabbit hole just keeps getting deeper if you want it. But otherwise, at the highest, highest levels, it's going to just kind of be prepackaged for them. Love it. And I think as we're going through some of this, um, do I have a new session in here? Not in that one. Yeah, like this, for example, you can manually establish a new session. And then on that session, you can call transact. And then one level higher than that is you can use the session kit, which I think, yeah. 
And the session kit is like a factory for making sessions. That way you don't have to make them yourselves. And then one higher level than that will be the uh, kind of the starter kits. So there's like layers that's this big onion that you can keep peeling back and getting to further and further um, customizable bits of code if it's what you need. Got it. And as it stands, like, if you dig through these tests and kind of see examples, this is all functional right now. The only thing I think the session kit doesn't do today is broadcast, because we've been kind of discussing how broadcasts are handled in this. Is it a, I think for now, we're just going to pick something and make it broadcast in one specific way. But um, somewhere down the road, we might get into broadcast plugins. You can see there are wallet plugins right now, but we're kind of internally talking about that still right now. We're probably going to start simple, though. Why so yeah, there's you need more broadcast plugins. Uh, because there's three different API endpoints that you can broadcast transactions to. Oh, you mean like send transaction, send transaction to, and then all of Yeah, and push transaction. And maybe you want to write a broadcast plugin that broadcasts to multiple APIs at the same time to ensure that it doesn't get lost on one of those nodes. Or, or to defuse with the flag to track it or something like yep, that. Yep, exactly. So we'll probably just pick one for now, maybe it's the send transaction to API endpoint and then add some flags. So you can say, I want the push guarantee or I don't want the push guarantee. Um, just for expediency's sake to get something working. But eventually, those could be plugins as well. But all right, walking that back, um, did that kind of explain how these plugins work in that the plugins are basically just classes that register hooks. And you can obviously add any additional kind of logic you want in here. But the interface itself just specifies this register call, which adds hooks. And then those hooks are what get executed within the transact call. Yeah, fully understandable. Cool. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns before we kind of move on? I think that with that out of the way, that's one of the biggest changes um, in how all of this operates. Um, I noticed that there was a, uh, if you go back, I don't even know which file I saw it in, but there was a, a flag that was like, can modify or can mutate, like can change the actions. This one, allow modify. Maybe it's that one. It was on or, the transact method itself when you were injecting the. Uh, yeah, the that would be the this transact one. Method. This is the transact call. One of the options in the transact options is allow modify. Okay. So and if you turn this off, then none, none of the plugins will be able to modify the transaction. Correct. Got it. It's just kind of a way for the developer to be like, I don't want anything to. I don't want any plugin to modify this transaction. Right. It's going to be perfect it as it is. Yeah. So that way. I mean, that works well with what we were talking about before with the signing of arbitrary data. True. Yeah. And it just, I guess, for other clarity's sake, the only kind of hook that's allowed to modify a transaction is this before sign hook. Because if any, like if the after sign hook was allowed to modify, then you know this, any signature that happened, yeah, yeah. is not going to be good. So uh, this is kind of the special hook. Uh, we have some rough code in here that actually performs the signing of the transaction. There's a wallet plugin that is saved within the session that just has a sign function that takes in what chain it is and what the request is and returns a signature. And then the signature gets pushed into the response. Um, and then very simply after all of that, the bulk of the work's done up there. Um, we have the after sign hooks that get executed. And they take the same parameters, same kind of operations. Uh, and then the will broadcast, if it's true, will execute the before broadcast hooks. It'll do the broadcasting and then implement the after broadcast hooks. These, I think a lot of these, the, 
The after broadcast hook, for example, is going to probably be play a heavy role in IBC transactions, because in an IBC flow, we want to take a transaction, sign it, broadcast it, and then after it's broadcast, we want to take the proof of that transaction, come up with that through some form of plugin. Um, there will likely be some form of signing on that, and then that will also be broadcast except to a different blockchain. So we haven't, we don't have any examples of that yet, but we fully anticipate that these hooks are going to play a major role in how IBC works. Uh, as you're, you know, broadcasting transaction A to tr chain A, and then proving transaction A on chain B. Yeah, speaking about the multiple chains, I saw that session has an array of chains. Or, and so, how, what's the intention for using that array? Would you be able to control it, like say, use chain one or chain two? Would it always execute against multiple chains? The sessions themselves don't have an array. They just have one chain. But the session kit, which I can just flip over to real quick. Um, the session kit does have an array of chains. So to do that, I think you would have two different sessions loaded, one for chain A and one for chain B. And they would each have their own unique uh, properties. And it would kind of be, I'm imagining that you would be executing transaction A on uh, session one, for example. And then if you wanted to prove it on the other chain, you would use session two, if you were actually signing that yourself. And I do, like, as I've been sitting in the um, IBC calls and thinking about how this is going to work on the UI layer, I do think that having the proofs done by some sort of third-party service by default is probably going to be the best user experience. Um, it may be a fuel-like provider where you say, hey, I just submitted, here's a transaction ID, here's the chain ID as parameters to some sort of API service. And that API service would generate the proof for you and just return it. And then either you broadcast it or the service broadcast it is probably the cleanest user experience and all of that. So that way, the user doesn't have to sign two individual transactions and go back and forth to their wallet twice. Um, since the proofs themselves are kind of trustless, uh, I imagine that we'll be working on a plugin to help accommodate that flow. So yeah, I think one of the major things we're looking for out of all of this, and we have about 10 minutes left, so um, is that for you guys and whoever watches this video in the future, we're thinking about what sort of transactions applications are performing today and how they would fit into this kind of plugin slash hook flow. Like, what sort of pains do you have performing transactions that maybe these hooks could actually help resolve? You know, could you could we make a plugin that uh, helps with your application that does X, Y, and Z, and then help us to understand what that process is that you know these developers are manually doing in their applications right now, so that way we can think about how these hooks would benefit um, that flow and really make it that much easier. And this this transact call is going to work in any JavaScript context. It'll work if you're writing a Node.js script. You know, you'll be able to add plugins in. Like, you could add a Fuel plugin for your, um, I don't know, some other script you're running that performs transactions on a regular interval. Or if you're in the browser, you could add a plugin to do kind of the same thing. The plugins should be able to work in both contexts, which is uh, a lot different than what we have right now. Like the anchor link plugin is browser only, and it only applies fuel if you're in the browser. 
but it'd be super awesome if I could do that in all the Node.js scripts we run for maintenance purposes. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff you could start doing with this. Like I can imagine that people could use the um, after hooks to cache that transaction and retry it later. So yeah. they're not potentially sending to, or just creating an analytic service uh, based on the after as well. The before, I mean, Okay, setting all of that aside, could you use the, so let's go back to the um, Diffie-Hellman or asymmetric encryption. Uh, could you actually use those plugins to create something like that? I don't think you have that much granularity into the wallet, right? Right. I think you could, um, but the key would need to be available somewhere for those plugins to use, which is what, when we I mentioned the request for permission system, I can imagine that the request for, for permission system would exist in these hooks as well. And then, like, if you did have some sort of asymmetric encryption plugin, it may be able to request signatures from that. I mean, I could still think of a roundabout way to use, like, you could create an object that is signed by the wallet. And because it's deterministic, the object will be signed the same every time. Yeah, um, this isn't applying headers. Uh, or anything by itself, right? Like transaction headers? Yeah. Yeah, right here on 189, it's generating uh, a transaction header mm -hmm. based on this get info call. So like this call itself is primarily for performing transactions. Like we could potentially come up with an alternative path to transact that is... Without headers. Know, yeah, it's, maybe it's a sign arbitrary or something. Right. Um, something along those lines that could operate outside of this transaction context. Like it's considering everything here is a signing request. Uh, it's really expecting whatever gets passed in to be a transaction of something. Th that's fine. And I think that that's actually great. So we see the same thing on other blockchains. Like if you go to sign messages on Ethereum now, for instance, it's very rare that you see a, a legacy sign message, which is just text. Mm -hmm. It's more of the uh, newer object format, right? Um, so this actually works well along that same paradigm where people want to see in a rich format the data that they're signing. Um, but th if we don't have, if we have a headless or a headerless uh, solution, then we could also use that to create uh, bidirectional encryption mechanisms or asymmetric encryption mechanisms without having to expose private keys or have custom functionality inside of the wallet for it. Yeah. I'm not sure That's how that would work immediately, but I, I could see maybe it would. Um, well, I would, you would sign an object. I would sign mm -hmm. an object. Those two results, we create a private key out of them. And then we use that as the exchange. So it's not the private key within your wallet. It's a private key based on the signature, which is also a high entropy, uh, high entropy um base for yeah. private key yeah and that's actually how anchor link exchanges messages between the wallet and the the browser right. implementing it so yeah absolutely it could just be this temporary key that exists and some form of a handshake that occurs that says yes this is what we're going to use it's not even necessarily temporary because as long as the um as long as the application knows what the original object that was signed was, it would be deterministic. You could continue sure. to use that until the session dissolves or whatever. Yeah, until it's like wiped out of wherever it's being stored. Right. Yeah. And then if it does get wiped out, you could just like redo that handshake process to start it over again. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I actually like that method versus trying to get a whole bunch of other wallets to implement new functionality. Yeah, yeah, because trying to get all the wallets on the same page is quite the hurdle. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And I guess to add some context, I guess no pun intended, uh, <laughs> this context here is also what's going to be able to be used to control the user interface. Uh, in a very limited capacity when you're in the browser context. Um, and with this context being passed into each plugin, each plugin is going to be able to update what is being displayed 
to the user to, to like help inform them as to what's happening in the background. That was completely random, kind of just an aside, but I thought about it earlier and forgot to mention it. So, like, like a WebSocket? Uh, no, it'll, this context itself, there's going to be a, like a browser transport of some kind. Uh, that is a what stream, a stream basically. Oh, well, wait, no, because maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding. Are you saying that at any given time, they'll be able to have an updatable, uh, an updatable or an updating context of the transaction that's currently running? Status wise? Yes. In, I think a lot of that will be predefined in the actual UI itself. But like with this context, this context might have a update status method or something like that, that the plugins, since they are being passed to the context, like this, well, this hook specifically, could call update status and pass in some string that says, uh, now we're fetching a fuel signature or something. And then the UI could be updated to display that message to the user. These the context itself is the status of the transaction, but it is also going to hook into uh, the user interface itself and allow like maybe a prompt. For fuel, for example, like in the before sign, this hook might call um, context.prompt and then say, do you accept this fee? And then the user interface is actually going to pop up and give them a yes or no prompt that says, to perform this transaction will cost 0.0001 EOS or whatever. And then only if the user clicks yes, will the plugin actually execute and modify the transaction and add that fee. If that makes sense. It will have the status as it moves between the various hooks, but it also will have functions that you can call to show users that something's changing. Or maybe you can also use that in the console perspective to so forgive my exception. You could hook into the hook so that you can update UI. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Through that context object. Got it. How how is it going to work? Is it going to be like an event emitter or I uh, we have not gotten there, but that is one of the things we've talked about. Um, and it's just the technical level, like we haven't started writing the code for it. I see. OK. I just figured it was kind of relevant to, as we're talking about these hooks, to also give the sense that these hooks and these plugins and this sort of uh, customizable part of the session kit is also going to allow these individual pieces to present information to prompt the user to to like enhance the user experience in the end. I like that because we've never really had anything which allowed us to track a transaction. Uh, well, we, we could do it, but you had to build it from scratch every single time. Yeah, exactly. And another, I guess, use case of that would be the after broadcast hook. Maybe there is a after broadcast hook that monitors the success of a transaction. Like it, the after broadcast hook then awaits and says, it emits a message to the UI that says, hey, we're awaiting irreversibility or something. Um, and it would wait literally and do API calls to the get transaction status API to say, hey, is this irreversible? And the could have some sort of set timeout, set interval, something going on um, where it is updating the UI to let the user know about irreversibility. And if it doesn't reach irreversibility, then maybe there is a control that is retry. And you could kind of trigger a new transaction from within that hook, within that plugin. So it gives us a lot of flexibility, not only from like manipulating and doing things like analytics or changing how the behavior of a transaction uh, goes, but 
it also like gives you that power to show in a UI kit of some kind what's happening for the end user. Love it. So yeah, I mean, we are butting up against the hour. Well, we are now over the hour. Um, I got to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to publish this recording. Uh, we'll probably start talking about this a lot more publicly. We really want developers to, like, you know, those developers that are using Transact calls and EOSJS to let us know what their problems with it are so we can make sure that those problems can be addressed with the session kit, whether you're in a browser, you're in uh some gaming platform that uses js or you're in the node.js Absolutely. context so thank you guys for coming and if you do have feedback i am we're all ears thank you Aaron. this is great yep. thank you yeah, appreciate it everybody have a good holiday if you're in the states likewise <laughs> all right yeah. Bye.